Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'd like to start by just saying thank you, first of all, to the organizers for having me. Um, my name is Oliver Gale. I've been in the Web3 space for almost 10 years now, uh, which feels like a long time ago. Started by building the first Bitcoin exchange in the Caribbean to address the many problems that we face over there with payment rails. Over my career, I've found myself in the privileged position now to be CEO and co-founder of Panther Protocol. And Panther is a privacy protocol. Um, for those of you who are closely following the space, you would know that very recently Tornado Cash was sanctioned by US Treasury. And the ripples of that have been echoing through uh, the DeFi and Web3 space. And I would say building a privacy protocol, in fact, building technology very similar in its scope and what it provides to Tornado Cash, our team has been deeply affected and uh, really is looking very closely at the implications of what this means. So I'm talking about arrested development and the pun is intended. So I got into the crypto space and into the privacy space because at the fundamental level, if you don't have privacy, you don't have sovereignty. Our democracies are built on the ability to vote privately. Uh, we have, for most of our existence in civilized uh, economies, been able to transact privately. And Web3 comes with it, this huge promise of being able to enable peer-to-peer -peer finance, to enable smart contracts and composable finance. It also holds huge promise to enable us to transact privately and that is being directly attacked. And it's being attacked uh, explicitly and implicitly. And when I say that, what I mean is in some cases, you have irresponsible regulators and irresponsible lawmakers. And in other cases, unaware and uneducated regulators and lawmakers. But for me, I get up every day and work on this protocol because I believe that fundamentally we are going to threaten our very freedom and our ability to consent and choose. In Web3 already today, every year without our consent, $650 billion is generated in ad revenue. None of it goes into our pocket. In Web3, there are 260,000 public transactions every day. That means if you're at the pharmacy, it's a public transaction. If you're shopping online, it's a public transaction. If you're sending money to your grandmother, it's a public transaction. And so is this a design choice or a mistake? Regardless of whether it's a mistake or a design choice, we have rights to our privacy. We have rights to have sovereignty and ownership of our information. And, uh, and I think it's very important that we take this topic very seriously when we're looking at the way that we architect and build the future of Web3. There are many builders in this room and at this conference. We're so early in the days of building the new internet that when people ask you what your job is, you can say, I'm building the internet. If you said that to someone today, they'd be like, yeah, well, I'm sure you are. What are you building on the internet? So we're all pioneering in this space and the implications of these matters are really important. So what happened? Tornado Cash operates what's basically known as a mixer service or a tumbler. You can deposit your Ethereum assets. They will be mixed with other people's deposits and you can withdraw using a form of cryptography, cryptography known as zero knowledge proofs. And essentially you can anonymize your transactions that way. What's happened is Tornado Cash has been very successful at providing this service. And it's used every day by people who wish to preserve the fungibility of their money, who wish to have privacy. However, it's also been used by criminal groups, by hackers and those who've stolen funds. In particular, uh, 640 million US dollars or so of funds which were stolen by a North Korean hacker group. So, as, and in response to that, U.S. Treasury has said, well, Tornado Cash has violated sanctions against North Korea, and therefore we are going to take action, legal action, criminal action, maybe civil action as well. This is so fresh, we're still waiting to see what's happened. However, 
when you look at the way in which they've taken action, there's no argument. This type of activity is illegal and it should be enforced. Uh, you should not be able to money launder. You should not be able to finance terrorism. You should not be able to enable uh, any sort of illicit activity using technology. And if you are, you should be held accountable for it. What has happened, though, is that the sanctions have said, well, we're sanctioning Tornado Cash. But what is Tornado Cash? Well, there's Tornado Cash, the company. There's Tornado Cash, the development team. There's Tornado Cash, the smart contracts and the addresses associated with it. And then in some sense, because we're in Web3, there's also Tornado Cash, the decentralized collective of people that use these smart contracts. And, and anyone, uh, anything connected to, to Tornado Cash has been sanctioned. And so what's the net impact of that? Well, the net impact of that, first and foremost, is that Nobody in the compliant world can use Tornado Cash, but everybody who does not honor U.S. sanctions, in fact, can. So North Korea is still welcome to use Tornado Cash, just no one else can use it. Um, and that has perverse incentives and is not the intended objective of regulators when they are making these regulations. So what we are looking at is you know, we sort of delineate builders and operators and say there are two sides to this coin. On the one side, you have those who are writing software, publishing software, building these tools. And on the other side, you have those who are using this software, these smart contracts, this uh, record of speech written in a language and published. And so, you know, this is not... Uh, this is not without precedent. In the early 90s, uh, there was a case with a Mr. Paul Zimmerman who had been working in the cryptography space and released a paper on PGP privacy, pretty good privacy. And this was an open source project. In the 1990s, the US considered strong encryption a munition and it was a criminal act to export munitions from the United States. So this cryptographer found himself, uh, very similarly to some of the Tornado Cash team members today, on the wrong side of the US government for criminal activity. And uh, because again, at that time, strong encryption was considered a munition illegal to export. And so, what Mr. Zimmerman did was he partnered up with MIT and he got MIT to publish the specifications for PGP encryption through their channels. And when that happened, the US government backed off entirely and dropped the charges. There was one reason for that. Well, there are a couple of reasons, but fundamentally there's one reason. Releasing research and publishing information is protected under free speech. In the US, that's a constitutional right to publish your thoughts, your research. And for the US government to prosecute or attempt to prosecute MIT of all institutions for publishing research was something that they knew was going to end badly from a PR perspective and it would not be a case that they would win. Today, PGP encryption or strong encryption is used in every payment transaction we use in Web3. Whenever you connect to a website and you see a lock symbol at the top, that is some form of strong encryption. It is protecting you from uh, hackers, criminals, identity thieves, and so forth. So when you look at that story, which was you know, 20, a 30-year story from there to now, and where we are with things like ZK Snarks, zero knowledge encryption, privacy technology, in this case of Tornado Cash, you can see that there are opposing forces at work and there are conflicting incentives. There's an incentive to stop criminal activity happening, which is important, but there's an incentive to also protect our rights, to publish information, to protect our free speech, to choose to protect our data and to be private. And so, what must be done today? I've been working in the 
regular, I've been working with regulators for a decade now on blockchain technology. And um, of course, building across that decade as well. US Treasury recently backed off because what they'd realized as well was that they'd overreached in some sense and there were a lot of legitimate funds sitting inside of Tornado Cash smart contracts and those funds themselves were inaccessible to people who legitimately had a claim to them. So they've updated their guidance and said that if you in fact submit your KYC information and prove your source of funds, you can redeem your assets from the Tornado Cash smart contracts. And so that's helpful, but it doesn't go far enough. It's our firm view that operators are responsible for how they use smart contracts and smart contracts are not subject to sanctions. They are not a legal entity. It is code, it is software. It's very important in this industry that we start to recognize that and that we stand up for that because if we don't, Web3 is over fundamentally. This is much ado about nothing. And not only that, with the proliferation of blockchain technologies and these public ledgers, you can forget about the concept of privacy of any kind. If I know every transaction you make and everything is on a ledger, and that ledger is publicly available and I don't have rights to that privacy, I don't want to live in that world. I don't want to have children and I don't want them to live in that world. And so it's a very important uh, it's a very important mission, to, to put it lightly. Um, so, and we can achieve this. This is not difficult to achieve. If you provide an on and off ramp, if you provide a front end, if you provide API access, if you provide service to other people, you are offering possibly a financial service. You're certainly offering a service. And if you offer a service, as with Web2 today, you need to be licensed. All of our smart contracts, all of these protocols, they need to be open and accessible. They should be peer-to-peer -peer accessible. If you host the front end, be prepared to get a license. I mean, that's happening, but the overreach is also happening, which is why I'm talking about it. So getting into the privacy space with Panther, the it was obvious that compliance was going to be a key factor for institutions entering the space. And so we began building the protocol and attacking the question of how do we solve for enabling privacy and compliance? And those two concepts are quite difficult to reconcile, but they can coexist. And so what Panther does is it does enable you to have private transactions. It enables you to do things like privately vote on DAOs, which you know, spoiler alert, that's going to be the next vector that comes under pressure in the DAO universe. Who voted on the protocol? Did you have a, a large stake in the decisions taken by the DAO? Guess what? You're liable. These type of things are coming. So Panther is enabling us to uh, interact with DeFi, whether it's a zero knowledge proof of something or whether it's a private transaction with confidentiality and at the same time we're looking at things like compliance and saying we can provide all of that information to the relevant parties. Let the operator be responsible for providing that information to their regulator. Let us provide all the tooling to make that easy for the operator to provide that in, uh, to their regulator. So that's that might be a federated institutional dart pool made up of major broker dealers and exchanges. Spoiler alert, the type of thing we're working on. Uh, but it can also be zero knowledge compliance. Why do we have every institution hold on to the identity records of you when those are periodically hacked and have huge cybersecurity costs when we can use zero knowledge proofs to verify that in fact the compliance was done and we can use Web3 technology to access that data when we need it. That is a uh, I don't know how many tens of billions of dollars of savings that or hundreds that will provide to the compliance industry, but that type of solution is possible with this incredible technology, with zero knowledge proofs, with strong encryption and with Web3. So with that said, I just want to close on that note and say, if you take one thing away from my talk today, please take away 
the fact that we all have a role to play in this revolution. And it is a revolution because blockchain technology fundamentally disintermediates centralized authorities, but it does not collapse the system. It does not remove the role of a regulator. It does not remove the role of law enforcement, and it does not remove our rights as citizens. So when you're building and you're participating in this space, setting aside the PFPs, the avatars, the NFTs, and the gains, remember that we're really on a mission here. And this mission is for us to truly create a better, fairer, more open and protected world. So thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Appreciate you.